Jesus. They made another one. Somehow, this film has a 4.6 star rating on Prime. What? How? Who is rating this film that highly? Great follow on the first film. What? What are you talking about, Dee Dee? Did we watch the same film? Great movie. Jonathan, you're dead to me. Uh, okay. Let's get this over with. Uh, where do I begin? Um, oh yes, uh, probably the beginning. Let me just get this out of the way first thing, okay? This film f***ing sucks. The best part about this film is when it ends, because it means I no longer have to subject my eyeballs to this abomination anymore. The movie begins by trying to clear out the poor writing of the first film by straight up showing you why Rhodes has a vendetta against Thaddeus. Because most people, myself included, had no idea what his motive was. The only reason I found out is because I dissected the film like a psychopath. This is annoying, get off. We see a young Dylan Rhodes running through a busy crowd trying to reach his father, who by the looks of it kind of just abandoned him for some reason. Why is your son not with you already, Lana? Why is he having to push through a busy crowd of strangers just to be with you? Why would you abandon him, you sorry excuse for a parent? <laughs> to give William Henderson some credit, his performance is genuinely moving and very convincing. Apart from the fact that he has a vice-like grip. Are you telling me this fully grown man can't drag him away? Are you kidding me? You're pathetic. I would have easily overpowered this small grieving child. <laughs> We move on to get a lame CG recap of the last film. There a lot of these illusions they could have done practically though. That would have been so much cooler than these boring CG renders. As pointed out by my friend Chris in the previous video, there is nothing mystical, magical or intriguing about a computer generated image or editing emulating real illusions. Seeing something physical and real that breaks your mind's perception can't be replaced. The recap finishes with a nice me. Me. Thaddeus is locked up making a daily prison <laughs> Thaddeus is locked up making a daily prison vlog on his website, thaddeusbradley.com. And yes, I did try to go to thaddeusbradley.com, but it redirects you to the Lionsgate website. Boo! Much like the first film, we see an unknown, mysterious hooded figure. Who could this be? It's surrounded in mystery. I wonder who it Well, that's Daniel. I can tell by his gait. They dispel the mystery as quickly as they started it by revealing that the hooded figure is Daniel. <gasps> Eh, hey buddy, what are you listening to? Entering a dark and dingy maintenance access path, Daniel cannot resist the urge to use his beloved flashlight. <sighs> Never change, Daniel. He finds a small metal eye insignia embedded into the wall. He goes to wipe it clean so he can get a better look of it, but he wipes away literally nothing, as there's nothing to wipe away in the first place. They input this mystical sting like he's just revealed some mysterious clue. Bitch, I could see the clue already! You don't get to mystical sting from revealing nothing. <laughs> he didn't wipe anything off. Daniel speaks to the eye in a super secret subway dungeon. The eye says, Welcome, Daniel Atlas. Um, actually, it's Juan Daniel Atlas, I'll have you know. These are Emily's dads. Fucking hell, I can't see shit. Daniel wants to see the face behind all this and goes to speak into the bottom of the well. Like, does he think there's going to be someone sat there waiting for him at the bottom? Can we just take a second to look at this room? What the f*** was it originally used for? Did the eye build this? It's connected to the subway, so does that mean the city built this? The eye? City planning? Psycho mantis. Who knows? Who cares? Doesn't matter. Rhodes is still with the FBI in case you needed reminding. Rhodes interrupts a meeting with the new FBI boss, Deputy Director Natalie Austin, played by... Sana Lathan. Well, I mean, it looks like they couldn't get Common back to play Evans again. I guess he didn't want his roles in films to be a common occurrence. Oh, bro. Rhodes says sorry about that. Sorry about that. What that do you mean? Do you mean this meeting you're interrupting? Shouldn't you say sorry about this? Shout out to Jem Wilner. He plays Agent Door in this scene. Who is he? It's this guy right here. He has no lines and is unimportant, but he still gets a slide on Prime's X-ray. Good for you, Gem. Why did they give this extra a name anyway? Private door. Fucking hell. Is it because you only see him when Rhodes opens the door? Oh my god. We're introduced to the new horseman, Lula, played by Lizzie Kaplan. She has this elaborate magic act where her head gets cut off to fool Daniel. This is exactly what I mean when I say there's nothing special about using editing or CG to create an illusion. Yes, they may have actually made it look like her head was cut off in real life, but they had to modify the couch to do it. We then cut to a shot of Janning lifting up the cushions to show that it is a real couch that has not been modified, therefore making this trick impossible. Camera then spins around to reveal Lula sat on a chair behind Janiel. How did they do that? Oh. It's just so stupid and unbelievable it takes you out of the movie. It w I think it would have been more fun if they had revealed that actually she had modified his sofa and he'd bas basically ruined it. Janiel could have been like, oh my sofa, why did you do that? Uh, again, more magic, aka editing. He's clearly tying a rope around her hands with a knot going through the middle. 
But then in the next shot, it's just loosely wrapped around her hands with no effort put in at all. And we're meant to believe, wow, she's so talented. She got out of that like it was nothing. Embarrassing. I agree. Why does he also just go straight to tying a rope around her hand? Why is that his first instinct? What the fuck? <laughs> the next scene involves Merritt and Dave Franco. They ask you how <laughs> They're flicking cards against a rusty old car. Dave Franco mentions that Merritt has not improved despite practicing for a year. No, 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 it's good to be positive despite making zero progress in a year. You need to remember that line, okay? Remember that. Skipping forward, Lula is now officially a horseman and is in the gang. We get a random tangent about Lula and her parents. Well, my mother literally knifed my father in the neck one okay. time, so... Random equals funny, rawr, XD. They get onto the topic of their next big heist. Rose rolls out a sheet of paper with the plans on it, but that can only be revealed by UV light. Where are the holograms? They used the holograms once in the first film and then we didn't see from them again. Why are, why are they not still using our holograms? It doesn't make any f***ing sense. Have some consistency, please. Now it's time to get the work. Skipping forward and the heist is now underway. Daniel is walking with a tray of food and nothing underneath it. We can just see he's holding the tree and that's it. Cut to the next shot and now Daniel is holding a contraption underneath his tray, which apparently we're meant to believe he had the whole time, which transforms his tray of food into a suitcase. Please! Just show he has that from the first shot. Daniel calls for security and almost comically quickly they turn up within one or two seconds. He doesn't even say where he is. Hey, I'm gonna need some backup here, security. Please. Hey, what's going on? It's like there's cyberpunk cops hey, and just spawned on? outside. Another use of editing to create an illusion. Why not just have them jump up from the ground from those hidden compartments? Out of the blue, Rhodes finds a tarot card on his tablet. Why the f*** does this suddenly appear? There's been no subtle hints that maybe someone slipped it there or bumped into him and put it there. This is what I mean by shitty writing. We even saw a clip of his tablet earlier with no card on it. I went back and looked through to make sure no one bumped into him and slipped it there, but there's nothing. It just appears. Oh, dude, I fucking hate this film. The FBI turn up and Rhodes tells the team to go to plan C4. Alright, go to plan C4. Rhodes is found to be the fifth horseman, so the FBI lock him in handcuffs. But, surprise, surprise, because he's a magician, he can just slip out of them like it's nothing. I thought that only worked with fake handcuffs. I'm sorry. Ugh, what showman. He has this awkward moment where he locks the FBI in their own handcuffs, but it just looks so clumsy. Like, why are they just letting him do this? They just stood there. Natalie is just standing there. Come on! Oh my god. Fucking hell, it's so clumsy, dude. As the gang have been found out, they need to escape. They do so by sliding down a construction site, only to appear in China. What? They do have a clever line of dialogue here, I'll give them that. They do hint at what might have possibly happened. Why am I freaking starving? So while the gang are in China, Rhodes is left alone, waiting for the horseman to contact him. Instead, he gets a phone call from an old friend, Thaddeus. That's a very odd shot, which is only on screen for half a second. Look at that, holy moly, he looks like a demon. Daniel has apparently never heard the term czar. Czar. Pizza. How the f do you not know that? Have you been living under a rock, you uncultured swine? I refuse to believe someone that lives in New York City has never heard the term czar. Pizza time. We then meet the main antagonist of the film, Walter Mabry, played by Daniel Radcliffe. Hey, Harry Potter, let's go. What the f <laughs> Walter explains how he got the gang to China. He tells them that they took the wrong tube as the correct tube was further to the right. I really wish they had just shown a hint of this other tube in the initial shot. Out of focus, barely in frame. That would have been really cool if he went back and looked at it. Oh shit, it's actually there. Instead, we just have to take his word for it because they never showed it in the, in the initial shot. Even so, if he built this second tube, why would you leave the original tube there? Why risk the chance that they might see it and notice it? Long story short, he wants them to steal a computer chip that can hack into any computer system in the world. And if you don't, I'll have you killed. Cool. Thaddeus somehow convinces Rhodes to break him out of prison? What? But his reasoning doesn't make any sense. He says Rhodes found a connection between him and the horseman in his apartment. You used a Form 219 warrant to search my room. You found a connection between me and the four horsemen, which means you can take me out of here on a 24-hour leave. What? Am I missing something? Why does that permit him to take him out of prison? Yes, the evidence is probably fake and fabricated by Rhodes, but as far as the FBI are concerned, that evidence is real. So why would that allow you to be let out of prison? It, it doesn't make sense. Oh, Jesus, man, this is exhausting. So Rhodes takes Thaddeus out of prison in handcuffs. He signals to a guard to let him through the gate. As soon as they're through the gate, he takes his handcuffs off. What? 
The security guard he just waved to is probably still in view and he's taking his handcuffs off. You're meant to be pre pretending this is only for 24 hours. What are you doing? I'm sure there must be some agreement where he's meant to remain in handcuffs for 24 hours as he's technically still a prisoner. Instead, you free him from his handcuffs immediately in front of the whole prison. Why not wait until you get into the car at least or something? Leave the premises and then do it, you fucking idiot. Back in China and the gang are in a dusty old magic shop. Dave Franco is distracted by a floating water illusion thing. Lula and Dave Franco begin to have a sweet little heart to heart about their past relationships. No I'm one cares! <laughs> <coughs> You're not there. <laughs> Meanwhile, Rhodes and Thaddeus are having their own heart to heart on their way to China. <laughs> this is so weird. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Rose gets extremely worked up. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> God damn it. Rose gets extremely. <laughs> God damn it. Rose gets extremely worked up and rushes over to Thaddeus. The way they angle this shot is very suggestive. Hmm. I am not my father. <laughs> you're not oh my god, what is good? Are they gonna kiss? I am desperate. Which means I'm <laughs> <laughs> that that shot of Thaddeus. Oh, I love it. The gang's next heist is underway. We get a cute little training montage of them practicing some card throwing. The reason for the card throwing practice is because the computer chip they're about to steal is roughly the same size, shape, and weight as a playing card. Hmm, how convenient. So they sneak their way into the building where the chip is being held under some false names. <sighs> My god, I was not ready for this scene. So they steal the chip, with ease I might add. Isn't this a super secure facility? Dave Franco then sticks the chip on the back of a playing card. We can see how thick the chip is from this shot here. We can also see how extra thick the card is here so it can hold the chip in place. This is like double the thickness of a regular card. Didn't they sit the same size and weight? I only spotted this extra thick card when I was editing by the way. There's no way you would see it on a regular viewing. So he sticks the chip into the card. In the next shot, we see the card is magically transformed into a regular thin playing card. Where's the chip? Where's the extra thickness? Dave Franco tries his hardest not to look suspicious. Hmm. Look familiar? Search him, please. So they get searched, and this is when it devolves into pure insanity. The card throwing. What the fuck? <laughs> what? A blind throw, behind the back, Pass the computer and enter Daniel's waiting hands. Fuck you. The fact that they were practicing this only the other day is they were all shit except for Dave Franco, but have somehow all mastered the element of card bending in a day. Even including Merritt. Dave Franco even said Merritt couldn't get the hang of it after a year of practicing. It's just so ludicrous. I hate it. Ugh. You would clearly see this card behind her bra. Come on, this is so stupid. I like the part where they use camera angles to hide the cards. I think that's pretty cool. It's just all the other stuff is absolutely outrageous. I didn't mean to throw that at you. <laughs> Why do they even need to move it from person to person in the first place? Surely it's better to leave it somewhere where they've already searched you and pretty much confirmed that you don't have the card, such as Lola's blouse. Instead, they keep handing it off to one another so they each get a moment on screen showing a cool little trick. Daniel gets told to turn around and in the least suspicious way possible, he takes eight seconds to turn around. Turn around. What is he doing, man? I'm sure he has nothing the guys must have been thinking. And guess what? Daniel gets given the all clear. And clean. And then he flings the car to Merritt. Dude, what are you doing? So they're about to leave, finally, and put this hellish scene behind us. But oh no, Merritt has to get through the big scary metal detector while he's holding the chip. They have the brilliant idea of using Dave Franco's wallet as cover for the chip passing through. That's cool. I like that idea. The security guard says, wallet coming through. Wallet coming through. Why did he say that in English, though? He's been speaking Cantonese to the rest of the horsemen throughout this whole scene. Uh, he's speaking to a Chinese guard, too. Merit does a sick MLG card ricochet through the metal detector as the wallet passes through. <laughs> what the fuck, dude? Are you telling me he got this good at card throwing in a day? The scene finally ends with them running away and speeding off into the night. Thank God. <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't look suspicious at all. Rhodes and Fadius are now in China and visit the same magic shop that the horsemen were at earlier. Rhodes tries to ask the shopkeeper if she has seen the horsemen. Have you seen these people? Fadius translates into Mandarin for him, but it turns out Rhodes can also speak Mandarin. <laughs> so why the f is he asking her in English? You ignorant little twat. Rhodes finds some old magic gear that his father had left behind in the shop. This is an emotional moment for him, so he asks Fadius if he can get some space here. Can I please get some space here? Thaddeus, nice guy that he is, chooses to ignore that request and continues talking to him. 
Thaddeus then gives Rose a slip. He leaves him a little note that says, your move, dickhead. How rude. Daniel thinks he's meeting someone from the eye, but it turns out it's Walter. He's about to give the stick to Walter, but then suddenly Rhodes turns up and takes the chip from him. So Rhodes gets subdued and is taken away with Walter to an abandoned ship. This is where we meet a fan favorite. Oh, fucking hell, man. This Arthur Tressler! Let's go, Arthur! This is the man who spent a lifetime plotting against me. What are you talking about? A lifetime to get back at you? Huh? I thought he spent a lifetime plot against Thaddeus. Where's this plot point come from? Luckily, the shitty writers use their shitty writing to spew out some exposition for us so they can clear up their shitty writing. Thank you very much. When my father died, your insurance company denied my mother her claims. The only thing we knew about Arthur from the first film was that he had denied the people of New Orleans their insurance payouts. He lost his money and that was the end of it. Now they give us this guff that Rhodes' mother was due some insurance money after his father died, but that too was denied. This is what I mean about shitty writing. They just dump something on your lap then and there and say, yeah, this makes sense. We just told you about it now. What? What do you mean foreshadowing? Where was the mention of Rhodes' mother earlier? Where, where was her struggle with insurance? They don't mention anything like that or even show it after the first scene. That could have been a powerful emotional scene, but instead we just get some exposition. I feel like they were just making up plot points as they went along. It's it's terrible. Turns out Walter and Arthur know Daniel has a chip. Your horseman have it. So that raises the question again. Why did he let him go? What the fuck? Rhodes gets locked into his safe and is sent to meet his father. The end. Since when did Arthur become cool with murder? This is the man who spent a lifetime plotting against me. Oh, okay. I will admit, the scene with Rose in the safe struggling for breath in a tiny pocket of air is very cool and very intense. I liked it a lot. The gang are reunited again back at the magic shop and they come up with a plan to take down the tea drinking English cats. They put out a small vid explaining their plan and Walter is not happy. Get my father. Run! Location change to London on New Year's Eve. We're here in London on this New Year's Eve. I'm getting a bit sick of this film so I'm going to rush through things a little bit. The horsemen pop up around London doing some street magic. Jack is doing some card tricks. Lula is doing fucking nothing. And Daniel stops rain from falling. I'm going to make it actually stop. <laughs> What? This film is so dumb. Holy shit. Um, excuse me? What? He explains that this was done using strobe lights and a rain machine. That was an act of me and of strobe lights <laughs> and rain machines. But for this to work, the rain would have to be falling in the exact same place at the exact same time. And out in the open, there's no fucking way that would work. This trick was based off the floating water illusion machine that we saw in the magic shop in China. But, hmm, who was it that interacted with that? Was it Daniel? No, it was Jack. I mean, Dave Franco. Why is it not Daniel that interacted with that water illusion in China? He, that's where he could have got the idea for this larger scale illusion. Instead, it just feels totally random. They, or at least they could have had Dave Franco perform that water stopping illusion because he was the one that interacted with it in the first place. It just doesn't make sense. I hate this film. Why does the FBI not arrest Thaddeus immediately? He's essentially broken out of prison. Instead of just having a casual conversation with him, like it's nothing. The FBI are beyond useless in this film. Jeez Louise. Dude, this film sucks, man. This motorbike scene is stupid. The part where they grab Lula by the arms is insane. Let's be modest and say she was doing 30 miles an hour. If the boys were also doing 30 miles an hour, that would be your elbows smashing together at 60 miles an hour. You would instantly turn into a wacky waving flailing arm two person. They get captured, again. They're taken to an airport and loaded onto a plane. Oh, nice fur coat, Arthur. <laughs> Look at him! Get those lights off me! Get, put that light out. I've heard that phrase before. Put that light out. <laughs> put that light out! Are you deaf? Get those lights off me. After some attempted murder via some high altitude dumping, it is revealed that this is all one big ruse to set up Walter and Arthur. They explain how they set up this whole charade by having a different driver drive them to a duplicate hangar with a, what I assume is a duplicate plane. That's how we switched the driver of the truck, which took us to a duplicate hangar. Okay, but how did they get the plane onto the water? What the f*** are you talking about? Can you explain that please? That'd be helpful. Basically, that's the end of the film. Uh, not really, but I just don't want to talk about it anymore. It's an eye, get it? It's an eye. Can you, can you see the eye? Oh. Overall rating, it f***ing sucks out of 10. I hated this film so much more than the first. I dare say I despised it. By the time I'd edited my video on the first film, I actually ended up enjoying it after having watched it like four times. With this one, I found myself getting more and more annoyed at the dreadful plot. I couldn't wait for it to be over. It's not fun, it's boring, and it's frustrating. Just don't waste your time. 
Thanks for watching. Let me know which film I should look at next. Bye. Ugh. That was so much worse than the first one.